Welcome to Raiders Roundtable, brought to you by America First Credit Union. I'm JT, Eddie Pascal, and we have several guests who are going to join us today on the special edition of this show. Uh, Dave Ziegler and Josh McDaniels have been let go of their duties here at Raiders headquarters. Reportedly, Mick Lombardi is no longer with the team, and Champ Kelly is the interim GM. Antonio Pierce will be the interim head coach as we begin this edition. And, Eddie, uh, a lot happened here since I saw you yesterday. We're in the building on a lot of platforms, and we welcome in everyone on all our platforms here with the Raiders. And uh, this was something that was building over the last week or two. Uh, The Raiders have had problems with offense on the field, some of the recent performances and a change was made. Yeah, and certainly I just want to start off the top, JT, right, where you and I, you know, it's our job to talk about this. It's our job to dive into it. I just want to take a step back for 30 seconds and acknowledge the human element to all mm-hmm. this, right? Uh, Dave Ziegler, Josh McDaniel has been very good to you and I yes. during their tenure here in the building. Uh, you know, guys who worked long hours, who certainly put the effort in. The, the reason this happened was not a lack of effort, but I just want to, off the top, just kind of acknowledge that there's a very human element mm-hmm. to this, but we look at the end of the day, JT, and you know this as well as I do. This is a results-driven business, and you look at what the Raiders have done on the field specifically over the past eight weeks not good enough not playing winning football yeah and we wish everyone who's been relieved the best and they go on to a great future here they have families and again as you said they've been very good to us yeah they're good people involved and and many good people still on the staff here as we get going so amber theo harris will join us in a little bit jason horowitz the voice of the writers is going to check in the great lincoln kennedy who's always with us on Raiders Roundtable. And we'll hear more and more about this. This is a very fluid situation when it comes to reporting on Mark Davis's decision and why Mark Davis decided to go this way midweek before the New York Giants come to town and the New York Jets back to back here as the Raiders will be home at Allegiant Stadium. As we begin this broadcast, I will tell you this when we look at what's happened to this offense over the last month or two and what's been brewing. You could tell that there was a disconnect Mm -hmm. with the performance on the field. Not the performances so much in practice, what was happening with some of the captains as they were frustrated. And I'm going to stay with the captains here because they're the most important players here. We'll hear from Devontae Adams and Max Crosby when they come to the podium and then they're in the locker room environment here. But the offense struggled, and the offense struggled in a big way. And whatever was supposed to happen to take this team back to a higher level, it didn't work. And that's really the big issue here. The plan to bring in Dave and Josh initially was to try to get to a Super Bowl level, try to win with what they learned with the Patriots, and try to bring it in here and quickly turn the Raiders around offensively and get the program going. A lot of good players have been drafted. There's still very good players on this team, including a lot of star power. But, Eddie, what happened here from Chicago, when I was on the Chicago trip and saw the body language on the sideline, which I talked about for a week, and then the performance on Monday Night Football in front of a global stage, that was pretty much the beginning of the end because clearly the team was no longer competitive, competitive at all on the offensive side of the ball. I mean, you bring in Josh McDaniels, JT, a guy who has had so much success in this league as an offensive coordinator. He had the jewelry to prove it, right? But I think that we talk about two things. We talk about the eye test, how it looked, how it felt. You talk about the body language. Uh, Certainly not there for the silver and black over the past couple weeks. And I think the other part of it is that we look at the talent on that side of the football in particular. You have it, you know, you bring in a quarterback in Jimmy Garoppolo who was handpicked by this regime. You look at Devontae Adams, one of the best handful of receivers. You have the rushing champion in Josh Jacobs. You have an offensive line that you feel really good about. You have an upper tier, upper echelon left tackle in Colton Miller. And it didn't click. It hasn't worked. I mean, you talk about uh, kind of how it looks on a national stage. On Monday Night Football, JT, you are not going to win football games if your offense produces seven points. That's that's the end of the, 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 the discussion, really. Take out the names. Take out whoever it is, right? At the end of the day, the Raiders offense on a national stage was able to produce seven points, and that is not winning football in a week, and that is not winning uh, football over a sustained amount of time either. Yeah, the offense was broken, and hopefully it gets turned around here really quick, and Antonio Pierce will get the locker room up. 100%. I talked to someone today who put it best. He goes, football players have an opponent coming up, and the opponent – The New York Giants could care less what's going on in this building here. They're ready to play, and the Raiders are going to have to be ready for the opponent coming up on Sunday. Let's take a look at Mark Davis's statement that was put out last night after much thought about what the Raiders need to move forward. I decided to part ways with Josh and Dave. I want to thank them both for their hard work and wish them and their families nothing but the best. No one MD as long as I have. Uh, Mark Davis made a decision because he was thinking about this 
for a while. He was talking, obviously, to individuals around the organization. And Mark's got a lot of contacts. And remember, Mark grew up this way under Al Davis and his mom. He's been through this before and change over here. And the way I look at it, and this is just my opinion, this could not be sustained for the Raider Nation and for this organization throughout the rest of this season and especially the entire offseason. It was getting very toxic when it came to the play on the field, and that had to be changed quickly. And I give Mark credit for seeing this and knowing that he did not want to see this level of play sustained for another week, let alone the rest of the season and the off season. So Antonio Pierce and his staff will make decisions about what's going to happen on the field. There are good coaches, several good coaches in this building. Obviously, Champ knows the roster very well. Mm -hmm. And Eddie, as we were here the other day, the trade deadline has come and gone, and you can see that the Raiders were in the process of making a decision, and they held pat and didn't do anything. Yeah, I mean, we talked about the trade line, excuse me, trade deadline coming and going yesterday. No action for the silver and black. But I want to go back to Monday night for just a sec, JT. And we talk about the body language, and we talk about you talk about some of that toxicity a little bit. But you know, we see at the end of that game the Devontae Adams helmet slam, and it really just now, in hindsight, feels like a bit of a microcosm for everything that we've seen, everything that we've dealt with, everything that this fan base has collectively felt over the past couple of weeks. A moment of frustration. You have the best wide receiver in the NFL who is, and we talk about this all the time, the ultimate competitor, the guy who is committed to being here, the guy who wants to put up points, who wants to succeed for the team that he grew up watching, right? And we see that disconnect, and we see that moment of just pure human upset, frustration, anger, whatever you want it to be. And you need to have the guys like Devontae, the guys like Max, the guys like Josh Jacobs, the Colt Millers of the world. They need to be aligned. They need to all be pulling in the same direction. So we look at this now, certainly a break from what we've seen over the past year and a half, but an opportunity, JT, to have everyone kind of pull in the same direction. Antonio Pierce is going to do a heck of a job getting those guys in the locker room ready to rock this Sunday now on a short week. But now in hindsight, we talk about that moment of Devontae that we've seen all over the internet, that we saw in the broadcast that to me feels very telling right now this move happened because it needed to happen mm -hmm. they didn't perform well this is a results business and clearly mark davis saw that this was not going in the right direction and the reason he hired these gentlemen were for the right reasons these are good guys good men guys who have an unbelievable track record and it didn't work and that happens all the time CEOs are moved. It happens in the corporate world. It happens everywhere that we look in society. And it didn't work. And a lot of people thought it would work. And now we get to the quarterback situation out of respect, obviously, to the new head coach and Antonio Pierce. We'll wait for his decision mm -hmm. on what's going to happen at the quarterback position going forward with Aiden O'Connell or Jimmy Garoppolo. But this offense, and what I think is going to be very unique the rest of the way, Eddie, as we talk to all of our insiders and guests coming up, is that this has got to motivate, because I think the players were highly motivated to play, especially the captains. They come out there, you saw the emotion, the raw emotion. They want to get back to winning. And the Raiders have an opportunity here to stack some wins, hopefully. And maybe this is a kick in the butt to the players, the locker room, everyone involved, where the Raiders can have a solid performance. The Raiders haven't played well this year on offense. The defense has been playing noticeably better. Maybe this is the jolt to the offensive line, the running game. Maybe there's a new concept in routes and what's going to happen going forward where the Raiders could be more explosive. We've been waiting for that. And I think, JT, the timing of this is all very purposeful, very interesting, sure. right? This is not a, a team that is, you know, two, you know, two weeks out from the end of the yeah. season, right? We have a lot of football left to play, a lot of football left to play. And the Raiders are two games under 500, right? And, and look, I'm not here to prognosticate or forecast what's going to happen over the next six, eight weeks. But if this team can now at home, back-to-back -back home games, put together competitive football, do what they need to do, in two weeks' time, you and I can be sitting here and talking about a Raiders team that is at 500 and still very much in the mix of things. So look, I, I think that the timing, uh, the runway that this team is going to have now up until the end of the year is very interesting. This team is not dead by any stretch of the imagination. And I think an infusion of energy, new ideas, new philosophies, I think is going to be a welcome change to everyone who watches this team on a daily a basis. A few coaches, yes, Eddie, a few coaches and the GM were relieved because of the last two games. Yeah. The performances against Chicago and Detroit were absolutely unacceptable. Unacceptable at any level in this organization's history. So Mark Davis made a change, and we wish everyone well. As we take a look at the offense and some of the inefficiencies that we've seen recently and what's happened here and some of the disconnect from what was being watched on film and what they were trying to get into at practice and bring to the game, I just thought that overall the quarterback play was substandard. 
the quarterback didn't have the ability to make plays to come from behind and get the Raiders a lead and to see those explosive plays. And that really was the beginning of the end, I think, of what happened with this regime is that the offense was supposed to be elite. Coming into the season, I thought this would be a top-10 offense because the offense had a lot of star power, and they brought back an offensive line that had the leading rusher. It didn't happen. So a change had to be made to get the offense going. And as we take a look at this and what's been happening here, the only team in the NFL not to rush for 100 yards in a game this season when you have an elite offensive coordinator in Josh McDaniels and you can't take away his track record, it's a good one Mm -hmm. in regards to calling plays. It didn't connect with the silver and black. And, and I think for me, JT, the word that I keep coming back to is, is consistency, right? Because even in that drive at the end of the first half on Monday night where Josh Jacobs showed us the Josh Jacobs of 2022, you know, we're sitting in the studio and I'm thinking, this is it. We've seen this movie before. I like this movie a lot where Josh Jacobs is controlling the line of scrimmage, where that offensive line is leaning on the Detroit's offensive line. And then it went away. Right? We talk about the lack of consistency. We see it for a drive. We see it for a quarter. In some senses this year, JT, we've seen it for a half. We haven't been able to see it for a full 60 minutes. And I think that is one of the big things that you start going to say, that has to be better going forward. When you're building an offense and you have elite offensive players, you can't be 31st in total yards. You can't be 30th in points per game. 15.8 is unacceptable on any level. The red zone offense which was supposed to be improved. That's the key why there was a quarterback move, Mm -hmm. was to get the red zone offense going. It didn't get going. And then on third down is a really big struggle, as I talk to the former coach often about it, What's sitting in this studio is how do you get the team going? There's only one football. And the issue going forward, I always say this with Eric Allen, there's only one football. And the only way you're going to get six or seven targets and spread out throughout a drive is you got to have first downs. And you have to have first downs on first down and second down. And I think, Eddie, the Raiders were always in third and long. And that's what blew me away this year was first down was first down, whatever was going to happen, a slant to Devontae, whatever they're going to do. Second down was a run into a pile. Just a run into a pile. You were hoping the leading rusher would get six, seven yards and bring the Raiders to third and two or third and three, which is manageable. Then you have Hunter Renfro, Devontae. You got a lot of options there with Josh Jacobs. Seemed like this year, and we'll look at the stats, there was a lot of third and 13, Mm -hmm. third and nine, third and eight. And defensive coordinators were able to see this. And I think also the disconnect was, unfortunately, because these are really good coaches who have been around for a long time, is that defensive coordinators knew what was coming on third down. It was very easy for them to go with a too high shell or to stuff the box or to try to take away Josh and then double team Devontae. And there were no answers recently. And that was unfortunate. And that's what I think led to this decision. You know, and JT, we go back to that graphic that we had up a second ago. It's hard to look at that graphic and, and kind of make peace with how any of that even, how you get to that point, right? I, I think that we look back uh, on the mcdaniels uh, Ziegler era from this year in particular, and, and riddle me this, like, what was the offensive identity of the Raiders up to this point? Last year, we, we knew what the identity was. We saw the formula. We saw it be effective. We saw it work. But this year, like, I would be kind of hard-pressed if someone asked me, say, Eddie, what do the Raiders do when they're effective in 2023 on the offensive side of the football? And I'd be hard-pressed to find a legitimate answer in that. So I think that when you have all these talented playmakers that we keep talking about, we talk about Devontae and Josh, Jacoby Myers, who's having a heck of a year, right? What do they do well? How do they do it effectively and do it consistently? And and ultimately, we aren't able to get an answer. And to your point, I think that's a a big reason why we are going through this change right now. Yeah, we bring in our teammate, Amber Theo Harris, who joins us, Raiders Game Day, all the other platforms that she does a great job at. And... Amber, let's begin with this decision. It happened very quickly late last night when you got the information, your initial thoughts. My initial thoughts were I, I'm not surprised. Uh, I was surprised it happened on Halloween night at about 10 o'clock at night here on the West Coast. I was actually still dressed up in my Halloween costume, uh, having to do news updates late at night. So I wasn't surprised at all because um, I had text, you know, you text your friends back and forth and everybody watched on Monday Night Football Um, the national kind of debacle that that has been the Raiders in this era. And a lot of my texts back to them were, I won't be surprised if we have breaking news this week. I really felt it was that time. Um, Even even, uh, during the game at one point, I looked at a coworker of mine and asked a pretty fair question. And I said, what more does Mark Davis need to see? Like, I'm I'm, I'm asking that openly to, to a coworker of mine. What more... Do they? Do you think he maybe needs to see? Do you think there's still hope? Uh, what has Josh McDaniels shown 
that maybe he's close to turning the corner or needs some more time. And in my opinion, I think that we had seen enough. And apparently Mark Davis agreed with that at this at this point. And that's when the news broke. You know, Amber, am I crazy to think, and JT and I have talked a lot at the top about just some of the the reason that obviously went into the decision, but the thing that we keep coming back to is the playmakers on the offensive side of the football. We talk about Devontae. We talk about Josh, this offensive line. Am I, am I crazy to think that with, you know, still nearly half the season left, that we are going to be able to see some tangible improvement from that side of the ball in particular? Yeah, I think any time, look, you know, all of us have been covering this game a long time. We've all covered coaching changes. Anytime you have a coaching change, it does offer a temporary injection of adrenaline. Let's put it that way. And adrenaline is short-lived. So I do think that we'll see uh, an improvement against the Giants and maybe even against the Jets, although that Jets defense is so strong, I worry about even being able to score you know, more than nine points in that game, 12 points, somewhere around there. Um, so I think temporarily, yes. My bigger question was, you know, the, the reports are that Josh and Dave were working on, through the trade deadline, you know, doing their jobs. And a lot of people did inquire. Those reports are out there about Devontae Adams and and other members of the team, but mostly Devontae Adams. You know, I love have I love Devontae as a person. I uh, covered him a long time. I love having him as it looks. He looks good in silver and black. But if this is a restart for the Raiders organization, a player that's in his 30s, you know, that could have yielded a pretty big haul in, tr in trade and um, draft picks. I think those conversations should have been anything but what they were, which was absolutely not, or I believe Adam Schefter reported was no way this is going to happen. My question is, why not? I mean, right now, they don't have a quarterback they can win with for the future. The, the, the Raiders aren't sure um, in what AOC is. I guess we'll see maybe some more of him, but we... You know, we do know Jimmy Garoppolo is not is not the future. He's not here. So why not look on from a, a, a bigger, you know, a more wider view of what can we get for Devontae Adams? But that's past now. So it's kind of a moot point, right? It's past now. But I, I, I would have entertained that if I was the GM. Um, and so I think, yes, they'll, maybe they'll win a couple games. But I think, we're you know, at best, we're heading to a six-win season. And then it's kind of exciting for a new era to see what happens going forward. Amber, let me jump in. You and I watched the road games together, and we've been frustrated watching the games, especially on third down. Before you came on, we talked about third down, and when we're sitting with Eric Allen and James Jones, and you just see a play that doesn't develop properly, and it wasn't even close to a first down, I think that's where the really big issue came around with this team, and the offense was a glaring weakness. You and I have talked in between plays on how could this offense – not move the ball on basic third and fives. I mean, they just couldn't run a play at times with all the offense that is here. So I think that's the reason why Josh McDaniels was relieved because of his tremendous success in the past as a play caller. And for those who say he had Tom Brady, yeah, he had Tom Brady, but we didn't take Montana away from Bill Walsh and we didn't take away Staubach from Landry. You got a great player, you take advantage of it. And as you said with Jimmy Garoppolo, uh, Jimmy is not playing at a level consistent of Jimmy Garoppolo. And Aiden O'Connell will probably get some playing time here. But what did you see with the offense that was so glaring, knowing that you know these players, interviewed them in the past, and they just couldn't get in a rhythm? You know, I was kind of screaming it from the mountaintops as uh, loudly but as discreetly as possible, if that makes sense. Earlier in the season, I was saying, you know, you got to let your best players shoot their shot. And I used the analogy of – Kobe Bryant, at the end of, of a game, you always knew the ball was going to be in Kobe's hands, right? The ball was always going to be in MJ's hands. And I saw a lot of red zone situations, especially early in the season, when you you weren't even shooting your shot. You weren't even putting the ball to Devo in, in Devontae's hands, nor were, were they putting the ball in Josh Jacobs' hands, especially on, you know, first down in the red zone. And that was my biggest question. And I hate to make offenses simple, but when a lay person can look from the outside and say, why are you not putting the ball in your playmaker's ha hands in crucial, crucial situations? We you talk about third down, which what they were one for nine um, in the game on Monday night on third down. A lot of reason for that throughout the season is not putting the ball in the playmaker's hands. I mean, I've seen them in third and two and not convert, or the play call was bizarre. And it almost seemed like Josh McDaniels at time was was overthinking. And it was it was pretty basic to me that I 
I think people would rather lose taking their shot to Devontae Adams in the end zone than trying to do some other play that, that doesn't work, like that Asante Samuel pick um, at the end of the Chargers game. You know, that play um, Asante had seen earlier in the game. And to call it again in that situation, and then Jacoby is the one that you're supposed to go to instead of Devontae, it was just, I think it was overthinking at times. And um, I think that's why Devontae Adams was frustrated. Mm -hmm. And to answer your question about why it wasn't working, you know, what somebody like Devontae was working in the past. Obviously, he had Aaron Rodgers throwing to him. But I got really tired of hearing, well, they're going to double team him. You know, they're going to roll the safety over and you, can't, you just can't throw there. And I was like, Tyreek Hill is is double covered. Um, Cooper Cup is double covered. Stefan Diggs, Co all of them. Um, A.J. Brown has been double they get the ball to the playmakers, and that just wasn't happening. And the sad part is that the Raiders have big-time playmakers, some of the best in the NFL. Yeah, and I think there's no doubt about that, the, the playmakers that they have on the offensive side of the football. But, Amber, you know, JT and I have talked a lot about these offensive rankings that we're looking at, and, and it's hard to find an identity uh, when you look at these rankings. When you see what we've seen over the past eight weeks from the Silver and Blacks offense, you know, going, going the rest of the way, what do you want this identity offensively to be? What do you want to see from some of these guys over the, the remainder of the season here? Well, Devontae Adams is still here, right? He didn't get traded. Sure is. J Josh Jacobs is still here. And both of those guys are two of the biggest professionals I have ever seen in my life in the way that they've handled uh, the situation that they've been in this year, the way Josh Jacobs handled the um, negotiations for his contract. I want to see an identity where those two um, are the leaders, and those two are dogs. And they... I think I looked at you, JT, at one point in that game and said, you know, what are these guys playing for? I don't, I don't think any of them are playing for Josh McDaniels at this point. I think those guys are playing for themselves, and then the other ones are going to be playing for Devontae and Josh and those veterans and Max Crosby that deserve better than the product that's been put out there. So I think we will see that shot of adrenaline because of professional pride and because we have dogs out there. And I think it will be it will be exciting, and I think it's going to be freeing for for Devonte and, and Josh. I do. Mm -hmm. I think they're going you're going to see them go off a couple of games. They're yeah. going to feel free. Yeah, Amber. I think Antonio Pierce was brought in to be the interim head coach for a reason. We'll see what he does, and we wish him the best. But he's there to give a shotgun of adrenaline into that locker room. And the Raiders always come out of the locker room when I'm there. They always come out ready to play. The coach always makes a good speech right before the game. But I think the critical aspect of Antonio is going to be to get them ready in the third quarter. I can't believe the stats on this team in the third quarter. I cannot believe what yeah. they would come out with, lack of adjustments and the ability to attack. And you got to tip your cap to the defensive coordinators who also make adjustments. There's players on the other side of the ball that make plays. But I thought your comparison of Kobe Bryant was brilliant because I've said that again about Devontae. You go down swinging with Devontae. You, you draft Michael Mayer to get him the ball early in his career, not year three. And I just thought that there were opportunities. And whatever happened with Hunter, and there's a lot more to the Hunter story here. He was concussed. He was injured. Uh, Hunter's here. I love to play a Hunter Renfro in the past, and maybe this will free him up. But I'll follow up with what you said about freeing up and now playing free and playing with fun. Playing with fun. I think the structure is really intense around here. And that's a credit to the former regime. They, they came from that, where we're going to watch more film. We're going to have longer practices. We're going to be better. We're going to be sticklers to details. And that was supposed to work. It didn't. Now there's going to be a new philosophy coming into this building, Amber. And I want to get your comments on Antonio and what he can do for the giant game. We usually host Raiders Roundtable looking at the opponent. Well, this opponent is a wounded animal. They've played terribly this year, and now they see an opportunity to come to Vegas and get a win. You know, first speaking on Antonio Pierce, I agree with you that there is a reason that he was was brought in. And I think what was lacking with Josh McDaniels was a connection between the players and the coach. Right. There was that lack of of connection. Antonio being a former player, um, I think that was strategic in placing him there, that there will be a connection now between head coach or interim head coach and player and a, and a mutual understanding. And as I said before, kind of that playing for your coach or playing for a guy that you really feel connected to. I don't think that was there. And so that's why Antonio is there right now. Um, I do think going forward against the, the giants, you have to be careful. Like you say, this is a wounded animal. Wink Martindale has had that team, yes. that defense playing very well at times. Right. And, and they've been in games. They should have won that jets game. Uh, they didn't. The jets came up. Zach Wilson, ironically came up big 
you know, kind of in the final drives of the uh, regulation and then again in overtime. But you can't sleep on on the Giants. You know, Daniel Jones might be back. He might not. Um, so, yes, I think this is a game they'll win. <laughs> let, let, let's put it that way. I think this is a game they'll win. I don't think it'll be as easy as you say. But I think Antonio Pierce, Mark Davis, is very smart and say in recognizing where there was a lack of connection and putting a former player that's very beloved. I know Justin Tuck is going to come on um, the silver and black show this mm -hmm. week and talk to us about this matchup. He loves Antonio. Like he played with him. So there's that, I think that camaraderie and, and you talk about the structure and the, we're going to watch film in the Patriot way, which always bothered me. You know, I teach at USC, I teach young people, that doesn't work with this generation of young people. It really does not work. It is an old philosophy. And the, the teams that are having success are the, you know, Mike McDaniel, the Dolphins, those kind of coaches. You know, Robert Sala, I know they're, they lost their quarterback. They're still four and three. Um, look at Dan Campbell out there crying, you know, on, on national television, a connection with his players. So that kind of like... Not I'm up here, you're down here, which was the Bill Belichick structure of we're the coaches, this is our way, you fit into it. There's more of a collaboration between player and coach with this generation, and I think that resonates, and that's why Antonio uh, might have some success here. Yeah, and I'm very excited to talk. We talk about that collaboration. I'm very excited to see what that looks like the rest of the way with Antonio Pierce and the guys in that locker room. But Amber, you know, we look at, at kind of the front office side of things, and, and Champ Kelly, interim GM, a guy that JT and I have spent a lot of time yeah. with, a guy who is incredibly impressive anytime you sit down uh, and have a chat with him. But, you know, Champ in, in a unique position now to kind of be at the, uh, you know, at the helm for the remaining nine weeks here. I mean, what do you kind of expect to see from Champ as we, uh, as we carry on through 2023? He's in a unique situation where, you know, we're past the trade deadline. Um, you know, what is going to happen as soon as the season is over? Like, will he be, you know, preparing for a draft? You know, he's in that weird position where maybe he does have an opportunity, though, because remember, he was being considered for jobs, for GM jobs, you know, before um, Josh McDaniels and, and Dave Ziegler were brought in. And so he's he's that caliber of an executive where he is going to get an opportunity. And, and I think, you know, he, he might be able to show something here. I think one of the biggest problems that was the elephant in the room that nobody was talking about. And, you know, I, I really like Dave Ziegler. I think he was, mm -hmm. is a really great guy. He had a lot of success as a personnel person. Um, and I do wish him luck, but I think some of the personnel decisions were very, very questionable. And, and it, when you looked at a roster two years after or a year and a half after they took over and it, it was not as good as two years before that, that's a pro that's a personnel problem. Um, and I don't want to get too into like <laughs> my true feelings of some of the personnel decisions, but even going, you know, to the draft, there's, there's just, I think there is an opportunity for champ to prove to be a true uh, evaluator of talent, a personnel guy that um, if he's given the opportunity into this next draft to build a roster and let's, let's see what he, let's see what he can do. I'm happy you mentioned Dave as we wrap it up. He's a good guy and everybody's a good guy. We've met, met a lot of coaches, over the decades for me here that were really good guys and were asked to move on. Dave wanted smarter, faster, and more explosive players, and he drafted them. Trey Tucker, he wanted those type of players to come in here and be foundational pieces going forward, and I hope that those were good decisions in the long run with a few of those players here. There was a disconnect with the offense. That's why we're here today mm -hmm. for this special edition of the show. There was a disconnect with an offensive play caller, offensive head coach, with offensive stars, and it did not work out, and that's why changes were made. So, Amber, as we uh, bring in Lincoln Kennedy after you, what's your message to the Raider Nation now with all the games left? As you host Raiders game day, you're fantastic. Right after the game, you wait on a player to come out of the locker room. Lately, it's been off a really bad loss, and you get a chance to talk to that player. Now you feel like this is going to change. You're talking about beating the Giants. we got a lot of football left. How excited are you going forward? Look, I, this is what I would have to say to Raider Nation. You guys are you know, I cover all 32 teams at times and you guys are the best fan base in the NFL. You're the most loyal. You stick by this team. You deserve better. And you have an owner that listens to you that wants to give you a good product. I mean, I think that you know, it has to be said was Mark Davis give him so much credit for being decisive for identifying there was a problem that there was no solution that you could not move forward and being decisive and making a quick decision not a quick decision it's a hard decision but a well thought out decision to give his fans 
and the people that follow his team a better product than what was out there. And I think that is very encouraging that Mark Davis is willing to do that. He is going to go out and find the next regime to try to give this solid fan base what, what they deserve. I think that was really, really encouraging because to let this go on would have been really um, a disconnect with with the fans and what everybody was seeing with their own eyes. And, and I have to give Mark Davis a, a lot of credit for that. Some owners would have let this drag on. Thanks, Amber. We'll see you this weekend. Appreciate your time as always. Thank you. Always fun. All right. Amber Theo Harris, kind enough to join us. Coming up next, Lincoln Kennedy. Lincoln is very opinionated all the time, but extra opinionated on this platform as we continue on Raiders Roundtable. Sixty years in the making, the Raiders now have a permanent place to call home, and the doors are open to get a world-class behind-the-scenes tour of their new home, an attraction unlike any other in Las Vegas, Allegiant Stadium. The Las Vegas Raiders invite you to experience the expertly guided tour that includes exclusive access to areas restricted to only football players, coaches, and staff. For more information, visit AllegiantStadium.com forward slash tours. You're listening to Upon Further Review. I'm your host, Eddie Pascal. Good morning, Raider Nation. Welcome to Raiders Roundtable. JT along with Q Myers. He dissects the play quickly and makes the move to the football. When you're a part of a team, there are expectations. And one of the things I expect from my team is trust. I work hard to win, and I trust my team to work hard too. That's why I feel good about America First Credit Union. They're my financial team, and I trust that they'll always be there for me and my community. I'm Hunter Renfro. Join me and the America First team today. Back to Raiders Roundtable. JT along with Eddie Pascal, Dave Ziegler, and Josh McDaniels were relieved of their duties. Champ Kelly is the interim GM. Uh, reportedly, Mick Lombardi is out as OC. And Antonio Pierce is the new interim head coach of the Silver and Black on a special edition of Raiders Roundtable. Lincoln Kennedy in a few minutes. Eddie, I wanted to talk about now the relief maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a tough word I'm using here, but the schedule around here was pretty tough trying to figure it out here. I wonder what Antonio Pierce does with that going forward. Yeah, a recalibration, I think. And you and I were talking about this a little bit during the break where, it, you know, not a secret at all, but the player schedule was a tough one. Rigorous, And we talk about kind of the way that Josh and Dave grew up in the NFL, and it was having that rigorous schedule. It was having a lot of time in meetings, the long practice. I wonder now if Antonio Pierce comes in, and we talk about his opportunity to kind of come in and inject some adrenaline. Inject, for lack of a better term, JT, some good vibes into that locker room. I wonder as we go through the rest of the way, and perhaps not this week as we are in a short week, but I wonder next week when he has his full shot at a full week, a full practice schedule, if we see some adjustments to be a little more player-friendly. Where you know This has been a long season. The Raiders still haven't had their bye yet. Right, so we have a lot of tired guys in that locker room, guys yeah. that are banged up. I wonder if it, that's kind of one of the first areas of uh, of focus for Antonio to kind of make some adjustments there to make this a little more player friendly as we go yeah, through the rest it, of the way. It feels like a really long season if yeah. you look at OTAs and camp and what, having the late bye week, which is ridiculous. I think when the schedule early December, out, come on. When I looked at the bye week here, but the Raiders have an opportunity again. I've I've been the five and five guy all year. I didn't say six and four. I wasn't talking about seven and three. I looked at the schedule and I thought that the Raiders had an opportunity before the bye to be a 500 team. But the key was how good of a 500 team would they be? Would they be averaging 30 points a game, which I completely missed on? And would they be having an explosive offense and then have the ability to maybe beat Miami, split with Kansas City, beat the Chargers at home? There are winnable games on the schedule as we bring in the great Pro Bowler Lincoln Kennedy who's always kind enough to join us, a big part of Raiders Roundtable. So, Lincoln, as I told Amber before she came on, now you come on here. Let's begin with how you got the news. Were you expecting this, especially when you saw the last game on Monday Night Football when you were in Detroit? 
Well, first of all, it's good to be with you guys. Secondly, you know, I got the news late last night, pretty much when I was getting ready for bed after a long weekend. Um, and, you know, I, it, the, the, to the best describe my feelings towards it, it's it's kind of mixed. I, I don't I think I welcome the change because we haven't seen um, enough move in the right direction uh, to say that we're making, you know, we're actually, you know, producing um, uh, the possibility of building for a champion. So we haven't seen enough of that. And it, and it seems like for the most part, and I, I haven't had the privilege of being in there. It seems like for the most part that there are a number of players on this team that, that welcome this change as well, that the frustration you saw uh, stemming from Monday night from Devontae Adams was just, uh, you know, a microcosm or a minuscule part of what we've seen overall with this team. So, you know, look, I, I know uh, I know Coach Edwards, and 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 the thing is, is that I'm hoping that he has what it takes to turn this thing around. So you know, it'll be anyone's guess. You know, Link, JT and I have talked a lot over the past half an hour or so about the offensive inefficiencies, right? And to us, that kind of feels like a big reason why a change was made, why it had to be made midseason right now. I mean, we look at some of these ranking link, rankings, Link. The Raiders weren't able to find an identity. There was no cohesion. You have some of these incredible playmakers, Devontae, Josh, as an above-average offensive line at times. What do you... What do you need to see from this group now? Antonio Pearson, the interim guy for the next nine weeks, what do you need to see from this offensive group to kind of right this ship or as much as it can be righted as we sit here on the first day of November? Consistency out of the offensive line. Don't have it. And that's the reason why you have inconsistent play. Look, the quarterback, you know, Jimmy Garoppolo has had happy feet. Why? Because he's looking down at the rush. He's not looking downfield. He's looking down at the rush. And that's understandable. So when you talk about, look, if you don't have a line, you have nothing. You can't run the ball. You can't pass the ball. You can't do anything. And that's what we've seen out of these first eight games. It's been inconsistent at the offensive line play, inconsistencies through and through. Every now and then they look nice and they look like they can do it. But for the most part, it's, it's because of the offensive line. Lincoln, we're going to get more about the structure of the offense going forward. Reportedly, uh, Mick Lombardi out. Uh, it's an offensive head coach and Josh McDaniels who's gone. Scott Turner in the building here. We know what he's done. And Norv Turner's son. And the ability for the offensive coaches now to get the offense going again. I know you like to run the ball. They were really great running behind you. And I've often told you, Colt Miller's on the left side. Run it behind him. Mm -hmm. He's a Pro Bowl type player still. Maybe this is the year he goes there. Or whoever the quarterback is, we're not going to jump ahead. If it's Jimmy or not, a lot of people are trending towards Aiden O'Connell being the quarterback. But this is an important moment. you got a young quarterback who hasn't played much out of the fourth round at Purdue. And you got a veteran who's won a lot in the regular season with Jimmy Garoppolo. And you don't have an offensive head coach going forward here. What do you expect to see? With this offense going forward, more run and discipline with the running game to try to get the O-line going, or just let it rip. Let it rip to Devontae. Let it rip to these receivers who are getting paid a lot of money to go out and make plays. I will say this, guys. It's it's easy to say just let it rip or tee it high and let it fly, if you however you want to phrase it. The fact is, is that the first thing any offensive coordinator needs to do, in my opinion, is you go to your quarterback and you ask him right out, what do you like to run? What do you like to run pass-wise? What do you like to run run-wise? You engineer plays around that, okay? And you understand your quarterback's limitations. Look, I don't know if Jimmy G can throw the deep ball. I don't – we haven't seen enough of it, okay? Throughout his career, I thought he was, he was okay at it, and he, he had some, some pretty good outings. But that's not to say that he can still do it. I don't know if he feels comfortable trying to throw the deep ball. The thing about it is that in order for any quarterback to sit back there, I don't care if it's a first-year player or a 15-year vet – any quarterback to sit back there, he's got to feel protected. He's got to feel secure. You know, you made a reference back to the day that I played with Rich. Well, you can ask Rich right now. He didn't really have to look down at protection. He knew nine times out of ten where the where the empty the unblocked man was going to come from. More importantly, he knew nine times out of ten that he was going to be protected to survey down the field. We don't have that luxury right now. So pushing forward, it's going to have to be the communication between, you know, the OC, whoever the future OC is, or just for the time being, you know, going with what, what we have in, in the cabinet and going out there and, and, and executing and creating plays where you can, you can create confidence and success. I don't think we have that right now overall. You know, Link, we're sitting here on a day of change as we enter a period of change for the silver and black. But just philosophically speaking from a player's point of view, right, we have so much football left to play. 
Is it possible for an offense at this juncture in early November to find an identity? Because we've talked about the lack of identity that this Raiders offense has had all year. As we sit here now going into this new era, this new opportunity for all the guys in the locker room, is it possible to kind of find and form that identity halfway through a season? When you're trying to redefine yourself, it's difficult to do it halfway through the season because you don't have a lot of time. You've got to worry about the players' days off. You've got to worry about travel. You've got to worry about preparing for the next opponent. So you don't really have a lot of time. That's why I'm saying you go to the guys that you have now and say, what are you most comfortable with? I would do it with Devontae Adams. I would do it with Jimmy Garoppolo. I would do it with Josh Jacobs. Everyone that is a key member of this offense, at least, we're talking about the offense. I think the defense is still a work in progress. We can talk about it more as well. But the, the offense, everyone needs to be made comfortable and feel like they're a part. You don't want to alienate any Anybody from a part from being a part of this offense and that's why i said to you jt a couple weeks ago when we were in yeah. chicago what Devonte adams said during to the press that week about i need to get more touches is very dangerous because now you plant that seed in your quarterback's mind and your quarterback wants to make you happy if you're my star receiver i want to make you happy i want to try to get the ball but you have to do it smart you have to do it intelligently because if you time it up or you show your hand too early you're going to have a pick six like you had in Chicago, or you're going to have more importantly, miscommunication like you saw Monday night in Detroit. Lincoln, you were a great player when you played and you've called all these games throughout your career at the highest level. What do you need to see now? This is an important question because you were a leader in the locker room. I remember you on game day. You were just totally dialed in with your warm up. When you look at Max on the defensive side, and we'll go Devontae on the offensive side. What message do they need to send this week to the team to look at the season one game at a time and get back in this thing? Well, you know, if, if I was Mark Davis, I walk in this locker room and I said, I don't know, and, and maybe he does. I'm, I'm just kind of paraphrasing here. I don't know if you guys wanted this move, this transition, this change, but I did it because I care about this team. And in order to care about this team, I want you guys to show that you care about this team. I want you guys to go out there and play. Because, look, when it comes down to it, and Eddie knows this because I've said it many times, coaches coach, players play. Administrators, administrators administrate, players play. It's going to be up to the players. So those standout players that you're referring to, JT, we're going to have to continue to see the growth and the elevation of leadership and the maturation as they become better pros, you know, throughout it. You know, the thing is, for I would tell Devontae, you can't, I understand you're frustrated, but I can't allow you to erupt so abruptly on the sideline. Other people see that and they feed off of that energy. And you're a guy that everybody looks up to. And I understand your passion, but you need to do that. You need to show that passion a little bit more constructively because I need you. If you go out there and give your best, I'm hoping that receiver two will give his best. Receiver three, the offensive line, the tight ends, the quarterbacks, so on and so forth. You know, like this is a moment where I think we should all be collectively very thankful for Max Crosby, right? We should be thankful for his, for his maturation on the field, off the field, the unquestioned leader of really this team, one of the faces of this franchise. I think Max finds himself in an interesting position now where this is the most, um, I don't want to say flux, but the most change that he's seen midseason, right? Since he's kind of adopted this new leadership mantle. Uh, we've seen Max, the player, grow, mature, get better. We're seeing that from Max, the person. I mean, if you're Max Crosby, Link, yeah, and I know you talked about it a little bit. What does your message need to be to your guys on the defensive side of the football about what the expectation is going forward and how that, that this group is going to elevate the entire roster? Well, if I'm Max Crosby, I'm telling everybody collectively, I'm going to continue to play at the level that I played at yeah. and follow me. You know, I want you to be like me, to do what, do what I do. And we've seen some, some instances of it, some examples of it, you know, through other play. You know, let's, let's face it, Marcus Peters um, picked six was a breath of fresh air. Where has that been all year? You know what I mean? So that type of thing. And, and who knows if you go back to the Pittsburgh game, if he intercepted that ball for a pick six, how it might have changed the outcome. So we see the impact that the defense can have on this team. And look, for the most part, for the last couple of weeks, the defense has done as, much, as good of a job as they could being limited to the way they are to keep the Raiders in the football games. The fact is the offense hasn't been pulling slack. So if I'm Max Crosby, uh, Eddie, I'm going up to everyone saying, look, do your job. Do it as best you can. I'm going to do mine, and together we can be good together. Thank you, Lincoln. I'll talk to you Sunday from the Torch on the pregame show. Safe travels as always. Sounds good, guys. Have a good one. The great Lincoln Kennedy. The best, man. One, one quick follow-up on what he said there. Really important. Devontae's the offense. Max is the defense. They're elite players. Just follow them. Just follow their energy. Follow, and again, Lincoln talked about Devontae had a little bit of an outburst. We get that. That's because they were losing and he wanted to win. We get all that. But Max is just at a different level now. Max is at a 
level, not only Pro Bowls, we're done talking about Pro Bowls with Max. We're talking about possibly Defensive Player of the Year. He's got a lot to play for, and he's a team guy, and I like that. So follow the energy of Max Crosby and Devontae Adams, and I think the rest of the players will get in line, especially with Antonio Pierce, a former excellent player, Super Bowl champion, who's been around this league and will demand that from this team. Yeah, 100%. And I think going back to Devontae, and I think that, you know, we talk about the outbursts. I'm, I'm okay with that. Yeah, I sure. like to see the human element to these guys. I think that when, you, you know, for your average fan who watches them on TV, oh, you know, well, why is he upset? He's a human being. He is one of the best at his job in the entire world, and he wants to perform, and he wants his guys to perform with him. But I think, going back to Max for a sec, I don't want to ever say Max was built for a moment like this, but I think Max has evolved and matured to be ready for a moment like this. The unquestioned leader of this team, the vocal leader, the emotional yes. leader, the every the oomph guy, the vibes guy, right? That's what you need. You need Max to put this team on his back. He, Like Lincoln said, he needs to go in that locker room and say, do what I do. Follow my lead. I'm going to get us to where we need to go. It might not be easy. It might be uncomfortable at times, but number 98 is going to be ready to rock on game day. And not only that, JT, he's going to be ready to rock in every single meeting, in every single walkthrough, and in every single practice the rest of the way. We bring in the voice of the silver and black, Jason Horowitz joins us, and I know he had a lot of trick-or-treating duties last night when the news <laughs> broke. Uh, let's begin. How'd you get the news? Your initial reaction. Uh, I actually woke up at, uh, remember, I'm on the East Coast, so I woke up when my two-year-old walked into our room around 2 a.m., and uh, as I was putting her back to bed, I looked at my phone, and I was like, oh, uh, Josh McDaniels and Dave Ziegler got fired. And uh, my first thought was, I'm going to read about this. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to guess I'm going to deal with this a lot tomorrow. I'm actually not going to read it right now. <laughs> so uh, I, I found out at 2 in the morning. And, and uh, I, you know, obviously mixed emotions about a lot of things. But, you know, you guys were talking about the energy that Max Crosby and company have to bring uh, moving forward. Antonio Pierce certainly is an energy guy. And we'll see what happens with him as the, as the interim head coach here. Um, but they're, they're just... The the lack of success for the offense this year has been tough. I mean, it's been tough for fans. It's been tough for the players. It's been tough, you know, calling the games because you see the the missed opportunities there. And um, something had to change. And I guess this is what that is. You know, Jason, you talk about those missed opportunities. And JT and I have talked about it a bunch over the past, let's call it 45 minutes, about the reason why sure. it didn't work with some of the elite playmakers that the Raiders have, right? You have the best seat in the house every single week watching the Silver and Black. When you see the quarterback have these issues with, uh, you know, sustained success with Devontae, the offensive line has moments of greatness, moments of struggle. Like, if you were to kind of, you know, sum it up, right? Give us the thesis of why the Raiders offense just hasn't been able to succeed consistently in 2023. What is it? So I have two separate thoughts. I have the thought that Lincoln has shared with me pretty much every week this season, which is the offensive line is not good enough. Um, that's that's something he's been talking about on every broadcast and every time we talk about the team before games. They're they're not getting enough push. Um, the scheme may be a little bit different than what they're best suited for. So so those couple of things, and I think we can all see that Josh. Jacobs is getting hit in the backfield a little less this game than than mm -hmm. first seven. Uh, but we've all seen that all year long, whereas they were getting a lot more push last year. and He wasn't getting hit for a couple of yards down the field. That's been different. Um, and then with regards to quarterback play, guys, you know, Brian Hoyer, you know, as as long as he has been in this league and he has had success in this league, it's been a while since he's had success in this league. And so that's what, the game that he played. Uh, as a starter, you know, and with Jimmy Garoppolo, it started probably week, eh, started probably week three against Pittsburgh. You started to notice that when he dropped back to pass, uh, Lincoln calls it happy feet. And I, and I don't want to put anything on Jimmy because I think Jimmy has been a very good player in this league with San Francisco. He really was. And I, and, and unnecessarily has taken some criticism in his career. Uh, I think, um, doesn't really look like he's positive what he's going to do and he doesn't want to pull the trigger and I think he's taken a lot of big time hits this season and you see it every time he's back to pass he kind of dances his feet move he, he doesn't throw it he pumps he's it's not positive and so there's no definitive action and and the team kind of feels like it's stuck in neutral yeah we're going to talk about champ kelly and 
Antonio Pierce and Aiden O'Connell. I want to start with Aiden O'Connell. This is an important moment yeah. for this team because I really expected Jimmy G to play well this year. I'll own that. I, I'll, I'll own no, that. It's not just you, JT, though. Yeah, I yeah. thought Jimmy G was going to come in well, here and back, do Wait, Wait, but think about week one, right? Remember how excited we were mm-hmm. after week It wasn't a big offensive explosion. We didn't have 300 yards. We didn't have 20 points. But it was success, and it was timely success, and it looked really good. Yeah, and there was Jim, reason to be excited. Yeah, and Jimmy G in that first game ran to close out the game, stayed in bounds. That was the moment. Yeah, that was his big moment. And then before he got injured and left the game, he made a really nice touchdown to Jacoby Myers, wide open, perfect pass in the end zone. He threw it to the right guy who was wide open. That was the Jimmy G I expected almost on every play. Just. Great decisions, throw to the open guy, because, Jason, you made a great point about the scheme here. The scheme, to me, could have been very unique and high-flying and fast-paced, kind of like the Showtime Lakers Amber talked about with Kobe. It could have been that, and it was never that. It was super conservative. I thought it was a weak game plan because the game plan was never over the top. Let's just let it fly, let it rip. Let's play with tempo. Let's play up pace. Let's get our guys the ball in and out of the huddle fast. Much more better body language and all of that. And it just deteriorated to a point where you and I were in Chicago together talking about it in the booth. You just got back from Detroit, and it just didn't look like anybody was on the same page. They went to third down on every third down, and everybody just looked around saying, really? This is what we're doing. We don't have one guy in motion. We're not running a deep and shallow cross. We're not letting it fly. Where's Trey Tucker? Where is Michael Mayer? I'm hoping going forward, if it is Aiden O'Connell, let me pivot there, that he, who's a deep ball thrower, will attack more in the new offense. What do you think? So so a couple of different things uh, with with those guys here um, with regards to Aiden O'Connell. Um, you know, at Purdue, and again, colleges and pros so different. But in college, you know, he had his his junior year. I, I mean, he was in college for a long time. So his second to last year, he had David Bell, and David Bell was a guy that's not a big time like speed guy, but he helped him have a massive 2021. And then in 2022, Charlie Jones, who he knew from high school, came from Iowa, where he was never used, and became an All American. And a deep ball guy. And so, look, Aiden O'Connell, if nothing else, I don't think at three and five that Mark Davis is doing this to say the season is a wash. We're going to be four and 13. We're getting a new quarterback. It may turn out to be that. And I think a lot of fans think it's that. Um, But if you're giving this to Aiden O'Connell, you say we got nine games to find out what our fourth round pick is, what type of player he can be. Is he Brock Purdy? Or is he, you know, any other quarterback who didn't was a middle round draft pick? And not that nine games is enough to say that, but Jimmy Garoppolo clearly is not this team's quarterback of the future. If in fact this move is being made, as it is being reported, and you need to find out what your fourth round pick is because you saw really good stuff in the preseason. Now you got to see what else he's got. You know, Jason, we talk about the infusion of energy that I think we're all very optimistic we're going to see from Antonio Pierce. But I think that a quarterback change, if indeed that is what happens, and I think we got to put in big, bold letters, reportedly that is what's on the uh, on the docket here. But I think that also gives this team a little bit of a you know an, an increase in energy, a little bit of, okay, this maybe looks a little bit different. This feels a little bit different. Because, yes, preseason is its own animal and, and the limited uh, sample size we saw in the regular season. But we saw a guy who was very much in command of the Raiders' offense, a guy who was very purposeful. That's the word that I keep coming back to, very purposeful with the football. So I think to your point, Jason, nine games, is it the longest stretch of football? Certainly not, but it's more than half a season. So I, if indeed it is O'Connell for at least up, you know, on Sunday, I'm excited to see what kind of his infusion into this lineup can do for not only the X's and O's, but like to JT's point, the in and out of the huddle, some of the yeah. eye test type stuff. Now, let me let me add one other element to this. Not like any franchises should run what they're going to do based off of what the fans want. Okay, so I think that's the first caveat to what I'm about to say. But this fan base needs an infusion of that energy too, Eddie. Uh, you know, th- this fan base, especially since last year, has been very frustrated, and I think rightfully so, about last year's team's inability to hold on to leads. Right, we tied the record for, or maybe set the record for most blown double-digit leads after halftime in NFL history. Uh, and then this year, the the just lack of offensive explosion 
with it with an offensive minded head coach, you know, in all of his NFL success mm-hmm. that he has had um, and the Pro Bowl players at wide receiver and running back like it, it just it can't be as difficult as it has become. And so, look, it may it may be a struggle. You know, you're throwing in a rookie in the middle of the season, if that's in fact the case, it may very well be a struggle. But at least there's a, a sense of we're going to try. If nothing else, there's a sense of we're going to try something different because what we have been doing hasn't been working. And so we're going to try something different and we're not going to go with the same what's what, what, what in for the first eight weeks. In 30 seconds, can you tell us what you expect to see from Antonio Pierce in his first game against the former team he played for, the New York Giants? I expect to see energy, and I expect to see the offense taking some shots. Now, mm-hmm. now the k- second part to that is they've got to give Aiden O'Connell time, and Aiden O'Connell's got to get rid of the football faster. We saw what happened against the Chargers. His clock wasn't fast enough, and something's got to change with that. So, so that part's got to be different. But I think we're expecting to see some energy with Antonio Pierce. This is not a guy that's that far removed from playing in this league and also being around college players, right? He was on an Arizona State staff two years ago. So so he's got that youthful exuberance. I think he's got the the sense of what it feels like to be a leader in a, in a locker room because he was that with the Giants defense that won a Super Bowl. So I think we expect to see some of that with this team, and you're going to get some energy, I think. Thank you, Jason. Busy day for you. Thanks for making time on Raiders Roundtable. Appreciate you. The torch on Sunday. See you there. That's Jason Horowitz. We appreciate him coming on. So we're getting guests in. This is very fluid as we continue on. Smooth jazz, baby. Yeah, I love this. I don't like the fact that a gentleman got relieved of jobs, and we'll be talking about it on the radio, but I like looking forward to how the Raiders can play as we look at the next four games. This is a big moment because I think the Raiders squandered a window in their schedule that just passed with the Chicago game. Just the Chicago game, and this was the part of the schedule the next two games that we looked at that those two teams are struggling, but not the Jets as much. The Jets are struggling on offense, but let's stay with the Giants as they come in. It looks like Daniel Jones will be back. That's a good defense. Wink Martindale, who was in this building back in Oakland, knows this team and knows this personnel, and he knows that there's going to be probably a new quarterback. So the next four games, hey, the Dolphins 6-2, and two, Kansas City 6-2. and two. I would hope that the Raiders win the next two to get to 500 and have momentum to split in those final two games of this four-game stretch. Yeah, I mean, JT, we've talked about the kind of uniqueness of the situation that we find ourselves in now. You know, you see a lot of these these head coaches, GMs, relieved of their duties in in late Jan- or, excuse me, late December, early January, whatever it is. The Raiders have a lot of football left to play, and I think you bring up a great point of being the 5-5 five and five guy. It's not a wild, hot take to say that this Raiders team could very much be 5-5. Five and five. Now, we look ahead to, to what happens in those after these next two games. Schedule gets tough, right? We've talked about it all yeah. year when we looked at the schedule, the opportunities that presented itself for this Raiders team. We're kind of, I don't want to say we're past that, but you're, you're looking ahead at some of these division leaders, uh, teams that have uh, do, uh, you know, goals of winning a Super Bowl. So, look, the Raiders need to have a fully focus on Sunday. This is a tough Giants team. I think a Giants team that is not indicative uh, of the record that yeah. they have. Yeah. A, good, a good Giants team. We'll see what Daniel Jones is going to bring to the table if he's back. But, look, this is an opportunity for the Raiders, right? We've talked about it all morning. This is an opportunity for every single guy in that locker room. This is an opportunity for Antonio Pierce. This is an opportunity for Champ Kelly. And I guarantee you that there is no one in this building that's taking that opportunity lightly. Yeah, when we come back, we'll talk to Paul Gutierrez, who will join us from ESPN, his reporting on the situation, what the Raiders are going to do going forward, and how the Raiders react to the breaking news on the relief of Dave Ziegler, Josh McDaniels, let go as head coach and GM as we continue on Raiders Roundtable. When you're a part of a team, there are expectations. And one of the things I expect from my team is trust. I work hard to win, and I trust my team to work hard too. That's why I feel good about America First Credit Union. They're my financial team, and I trust that they'll always be there for me and my community. I'm Hunter Renfro. Join me and the America First team today. 60 years in the making, the Raiders now have a permanent place to call home, and the doors are open to get a world-class behind-the-scenes tour of their new home, an attraction unlike any other in Las Vegas, Allegiant Stadium. The Las Vegas Raiders invite you to experience the expertly guided tour that includes exclusive access to areas restricted to only football players, coaches, and staff. 
For more information, visit AllegiantStadium.com forward slash tours. You're listening to Upon Further Review. I'm your host, Eddie Pascal. Good morning, Raider Nation. Welcome to Raiders Roundtable. JT along with Q Myers. He dissects the play quickly and makes the move to the football. to a Raiders Roundtable presented by America First Credit Union. JT along with Eddie Pascal. Pleasure to bring in Paul Gutierrez from ESPN. Kind enough to join us with the breaking news overnight. So, Paul, your reaction and how the Raiders handled this news on a short week going into a home game against the New York Giants. Yeah, trick or treat, guys, right? I mean, <laughs> what, a wild, what a wild night. Get back in from, uh, you know, having a good time with the family and everything. And and uh, you, like as you mentioned earlier, JT, you don't, really want to celebrate by dancing on the grave of somebody who just lost their job. But then you look forward, as Eddie said, too, to the potential, the 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 uh, electricity that could possibly be coming in because this team has been kind of just dead man walking throughout the season. And it's been bizarre to watch it because, you know, when Josh McDaniels was hired, he was hired as this offensive guru, this genius that's going to get this thing going. And, and if anything, we've seen nothing but regression through the beginning of this season. So uh, for Mark Davis to make this move at this time, I talked to him real briefly last night. Um, you know, nothing that he was really relishing, but also kind of looking forward and, and kind of excited about the potential of the future with the, the new guys at the top. You know, Paul, JT and I have talked so much this morning about the offensive struggles kind of wholesale, right? Like it's hard to pick any numbers yeah. out of what we've seen over the past, you know, call it eight, nine weeks that gives you any type of, okay, this is what the Raiders do well. From your kind of perspective, Paul, from what you've seen from the offense in particular, what has been that major disconnect? What has been the reason for, you know, not being able to get Devontae going, for the run game to struggle as much as it has? Like what, what has it been from your point of view? Everything. I mean, <laughs> it's been everything. They haven't been able to do anything and if you're going to point fingers which you don't really want to do in a team sport i guess but to me and, I, and i've said this numerous times on, when i've been on with jt as well on the radio is it uh, games to me always begin and end on the offensive line and at the beginning of the season they simply couldn't open any holes for josh jacobs to run through right and yet this was basically the same line that helped him become the the league rushing leader last year then as time went on it couldn't protect Jimmy, who you know was going to get get beat up at some point anyway, and then that's been his history. And you've seen that he's already missed two and a half games. So it, it kind of if there's going to be one part to kind of look at and try to dissect and try to fix, I think that's where you have to start. I don't think that I know that's where you have to start because that's where the games are won and losses down in the trenches. And then beyond that, the sense I got from up in the press box and in talking to guys in the locker room was it almost felt like Josh McDaniels lost trust in his offense. Wouldn't go for certain things, you know, not going for the two point conversion at home against the Steelers acting as of, almost as if he thought he had the 85 bears defense out there, which the Raiders defense has played really well of late, but that's not the 85 bears defense either. So if you don't have trust in your hand picked offense, the scheme that you brought with you, the, the, the sole reason really why you were hired, well, then that's that's a pretty much a, an indictment upon yourself as well. Well, Paul, you nailed it. You and I have talked about this on radio. You have an offensive head coach who was just relieved that had tremendous success in this league because his offenses were clutch. We haven't used that word. They were clutch. Better players, of course, Tom Brady, whatever you want to say. But he was a guy who called clutch plays, and his players made plays. And I just think – that what happened if he was ever going to get a mulligan, and I don't know this to be true, he would have just opened it up more. He would have been more aggressive. There would have just been more explosive plays, more chances for Devontae and others to make plays. And I just believe, this is my opinion, I don't think that the former coach had trust with the players. He didn't. He was used to a standard of calling certain plays and plays being made, and he often said execution. And the way I read the execution was, they had the plays, they had them, they ran them in practice, and they worked. And then when the game came around, the trust factor was gone. It could have been because of a pre-snap penalty, could have been because of a drop, whatever it was, and it just became more conservative 
with too many star players. I never understood yeah. that. I respected it because of him being the head coach. I just hope going forward that it's going to be more fun in the offense for the players to be explosive. We're going to see some new formations. We're going to see different routes, Paul, going forward. Is that possible without having a new offensive head coach in the building? Well, it has to be, and that's that's my biggest question. Whenever we when we get the the press conference going, and to be able to ask the questions is, what offense are you going to run? Because the last offense, <laughs> that's gone, right? Mm-hmm. It, it left with Josh McDaniels. It it left with with Mick Lombardi. Um, who's going to call the plays? What's the scheme going to be like? And and how do you get the stars? I mean, you've got two all pros on that roster. How do you get those guys more involved? Uh, how do you get the offensive line to show more push? How fine is that line between design? And desire. That's been the big thing with me all along with, with this team is they've got the stars. They, they've they got uh, the personalities and it's just not showing up on the stat sheet. And, and, and I fully agree with you, JT. Uh, it just seemed to be a lack of trust. And if you don't have trust in the guys that you brought in again, where does that problem start? Mm. Not on the offensive line. It starts on the decision maker. You know, Paul, today's kind of a unique day, right, where we kind of reflect back and look every, on everything that's happened, but look ahead as well. But just kind of sticking on, on this kind of reflection, you know, I, I keep thinking about the curious case of the Raiders offense and those two games, <laughs> JT, at the end of the season last year with Stidham under center, yeah. the electricity, the creativity we saw from the head coach, the fun, for lack of a better word. How did we get away from that? Because it, it feels like now, looking at that offense at the end of 2022 and the offense we've seen in 2023, a, a lot of similar pieces. But what? Where was the disconnect there, Paul? Uh, you know, and this is one of the, the the things that I suggested in 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 one of my columns towards the end of the last season was, you're right, that excitement that we saw and and the, uh, yeah, they went 0 and 2. They did lose those Sh- two games. Fair, but there was something fair. about the offense. There was something about the offense that was clicking. There seemed to be again. There's that word trust. Josh McDaniels as a play caller seemed to have more trust in Jared Stidham as a quarterback than he did in Derek Carr, right, wrong, and different, whatever. That's the way it appeared. And when they let Jared leave, uh, and, and I've been told that he was lowballed in a contract offer and free agency, when they let him leave the building, that was strange there too because it was like, wait a minute, this guy actually showed what, what it looks like, what the offense is supposed to look like with somebody who's well-versed in it. Because remember, that's the only scheme that Jared Stidham had ever known since entering the NFL because he came from the Patriots as well. Okay, so the next thing is you bring in Jimmy Garoppolo, who equated Spanish to Italian because they're similar, mm-hmm. but they're the kind of romance languages, but at the same time, they're not the same. So he's going to have to relearn it, but he knew the scheme. It just hasn't worked out. So that, to me, is where that initial disconnect was, was not having a single returner in that quarterback room for the first time since the late 90s. That's the first time that the Raiders have not had a, a returner in that quarterback room since. And if that's the most important position in all of team sports and you're starting fresh and starting anew there, plus you're bringing in a guy in Jimmy Garoppolo, no, no, no shade on him whatsoever, but his history is what it is. He's had to play catch it basically this whole time, having signed the contract, having had the, the foot surgery, having missed all of the on-field activities during OTAs and the off-season program being on a pitch count during training camp, and then, oh, yeah, missing two and a half games with the concussion and the back injury. Mm-hmm. It's been, you know, we were talking about clutch, JT. It's been more like a slip clutch. I don't know if you ever drove a stick shift. <laughs> I have, I Back have. in the day. Back in the day. <laughs> you know, you had, if, this, if the clutch wasn't working, you weren't going anywhere, and that's kind of what the offense has been like. Paul Gutierrez is our guest from ESPN. Before we get to Champ Kelly, one more follow-up on Mark Davis. I know that Mark loves the fans, and he loves the players, and I'm interested in your reporting going forward because of your – long-time relationship with Mark about why he made this decision and talking and we're seeing other insiders talking about the dinners he had and what was going on along the way. Uh, Mark made this move, I believe, part of it because going forward, he didn't see this getting fixed. That's quite frankly, the offense wasn't going to get better and you can't give this coach an opportunity to have a newer quarterback, either Aiden O'Connell, draft another one, get a free agent quarterback, bring in more offensive weapons if it's going this bad. Paul, isn't that what this is all about? It went so badly on offense, so terribly on offense, that you have to get rid of an offensive head coach because you don't see the vision of it going forward. What's the plan, right? That, that to me, would have been the the question. What is the plan? What are you going to do to implement it? And if you don't see the plan coming to fruition anytime soon, then, yeah, it's time to to cut bait. And it's it's unfortunate. It's unusual. It, again, strikes at the heart of what is most important to to a lot of successful teams, continuity. The fact that the Pittsburgh Steelers, (laughs) JT, have had three head coaches 
in my lifetime, and I was born in 1970, that, that's mind-blowing to me. The Raiders, with, with the coaching turnover and everything, they, they need that continuity. They need that stability. So when you're having to, to remove a, a, an offensive-minded head coach because the offense just has not been working and, and you see no plan, no, nothing for it to go forward, yeah, it, it's simply time. And I'll use that same phrase I used when they moved on from the nine-year starter of the year before. It was simply time. And if you don't see a plan and see how it can work going forward, it's beyond time. Yeah, certainly. And I think that's what we've seen over the past, let's call it 24 hours or 18 hours, I guess, late night last night uh, here in the Raider yeah. Nation. But, Paul, you know, we, we talk about some of the uniqueness of the situation. Raiders got a lot of football to play left. We're, we're not even technically halfway through the season right now. When you look at realistic expectations for this team, and JT and I have talked about a lot this morning where, you know, not to get ahead of ourselves, but there is a world in which, Paul, the Raiders are sitting at 5-5 five and five two weeks from now realistically, when you look at the talent on this roster, when you look at what the Raiders have upcoming over the next three, four, five weeks, what should fans of this team you know, expect to see from this group going forward? Well, I think it would be unfair to expect wins um, at this point because you just don't know exactly what, what you're going to get. Uh, and, and yet they have something to lean on, something that happened two years ago, right? That emotional bounce that came after John Gruden was forced out and Rich Versace came in. And they went on that unlikely run and won four straight games. Every ball bounced their way. You can't count on that. But we've seen it happen before. So realistically, I think all they can really hope for is just a better effort. Not even a better effort. Just better game planning. Better um, execution. Uh, more excitement, as you guys were talking about earlier. And if there's one thing we've seen about Pierce. He's an excitable guy. Being a longtime NFL linebacker, you have to have that passion. Mm -hmm. and, and we'll see how that spreads across the rest of, of the team. Uh, the defense, like I said, was playing well. Yeah, they gave up a lot of yards in the, that game on Monday night, but they were the only reason the Raiders were in it with the three takeaways. So if that can spread and it's infectious to the rest of the team, then, then you're working with something. and You can figure out what's going on there. But again, the big question to me is, who's the quarterback? Who's the play caller? What's the offense look like? Because that is kind of dangerous to try to, to, to do something like that in the middle of a season. Because when we saw it two years ago, it was still John Gruden's offense, so to speak. But but Ole, he he was at the controls, and he was able to, to put his own spin on it. I don't know who that guy's going to be now. The interim GM is Champ Kelly. Uh, give us a preview of a couple of questions you'll be asking of him when he comes to the podium. I guess number one is, what's the plan? What's your vision? Um, you know, this is the first time in this in this uh, position here. You're obviously, you know, you're not going to say it out loud, but, but he's obviously auditioning for the job long term. Mm -hmm. But you also have to take care of the short term. So how do you balance those two, those two visions going forward, which basically started last night? Yeah, and I think that Champ, you know, every time that JT and I have talked to Champ, I mean, a guy who's, who's clearly very knowledgeable, a guy who I think that these players, these these scouts, these coaches are going to be, be able to rally behind. I mean, how does Champ kind of – kind of find that unique, delicate middle place, Paul, of, to your point, being focused on the here or the now, the, hey, we got to play the Giants on Sunday, yeah. but also being aware of, like, hey, I have a really unique, incredible opportunity, excuse me, opportunity in front of me in the long term as well. Yeah, and that's that's to be the fly on the wall in the conversation with Mark Davis and Champ, right? Is it, just to find out exactly what, what's expected of him. And if it's simply just win, baby, okay, right? So it's it's going to be interesting to see exactly what his vision is, uh, what's expected of him from from the top of the building, and just kind of from there. But right here, right now, they've got a couple games. They've got one game they got to win. They've got to beat the New York Football Giants on Sunday. Yeah, last interim head coach that I remember talking about nationally on the platforms and locally here in Vegas was Jeff Saturday coming in with Indianapolis and winning a game here at Allegiant Stadium. That was a epic disaster because of his yep. lack of skill set, former great player. And I'll bring it into Antonio Pierce, who gets an opportunity as an interim head coach. And you talk about him performing for the future in a GM. I think the same thing with the head coach. I don't know him well, but the few times I've talked to him, he's a high-energy guy, and I think he's going to come out swinging. And you, a really important point here is I, the defense is going to be okay. The linebackers, yeah. Spillane was brought in. Hopefully Diablo's yeah. getting healthier. What they're going to do with the potential of nickel and who's going to play. The safeties have done a nice job. We know Max is there. But I can't wait to see what he directs the offense to do. What that message is going to be because 
Paul, if he's going to have a shot, not only with this team, within the league to be a head coach down the road, I think people will be really impressed if he's the guy who kickstarts this offense. Again, and just they got to get off, off to a fast start. The same way that we saw it two years ago when they went to Denver and you saw Ole running the offense. It was like, wait a minute, all of a sudden they're using Kenyon Drake? All of a sudden we're seeing these end around plays. We're seeing we're seeing the the uh tools being put to use. I, I would expect some of that. And um I you know, were I a betting man and if I'd gone to UN L V and if we were in Las Vegas, I would expect to see a little bit more Hunter Renfro on third down. I agree with that. That is a unique, unique take on that from yeah. Paul Gutierrez. Paul, appreciate your time. I know there's going to be a lot of reporting. You have a lot of sources here in the building and around the league. Really appreciate you on yeah. Raiders Roundtable. Thank you. Sounds good, guys. Have a good day. All right, Paul Gutierrez. Paul checking in. He had a lot of good things yeah. to say about what's happening going forward. We're trying to – this is fluid. This is breaking news and trying to understand. We understand why the move was made. Now everything's going to kind of get unique in the building. When it comes to coaching going forward and have to concentrate on this. I talked to an executive outside the organization who reminded me, again, that the Giants don't care about this. The Giants aren't Nor should they. partying about this. They're not saying we. The Giants are prepping for the Raiders, and the Giants are wondering who's going to play quarterback. The Giants are wondering what the new scheme is going to look like. The Giants got a head start on the Raiders. They had a longer week. The Raiders have a shorter week. Raiders are banged up. Couple players are in protocol for concussions. There's some injuries here. And I think it's very important as we look at the schedule again that Antonio Pierce brings this team together and tries to have some fun with them. It's sad to lose a coach and a GM. A lot of the players were tied to Dave Ziegler. They were here because of Dave Ziegler, and they loved the guy. And the coach, they respected the former coach. But now all eyes are on Antonio Pierce to quickly motivate the players to say, let's get back to work and let's have some great practices. You know, I think the moment that I'm, I'm looking forward to, JT, and, and we'll have to wait until Sunday to see it, I cannot wait to hear what that Antonio Pierce pregame speech is going to be like. Mm-hmm. I cannot wait. We talk about the energy this guy's bringing. You brought up a great point where he is not a gentleman that is so removed from being a player in the NFL. The experience at Arizona State, working with young men, guys on the ascent, guys who want to play in the NFL, I think that's invaluable experience that he's going to be able to kind of use and utilize to do it advantage uh, uh, you know starting this Sunday but I think Paul brought up a great point too that I, I, I kind of want to stick with for a sec of what are we going to see in terms of the wrinkles from the offense mm-hmm. right now we still have a lot of questions right and that's not a bad thing that's just our reality who's going to call plays what does it look like are we going to see wholesale changes personnel wise are we going to see kind of a a transition to something that maybe we haven't seen the first eight weeks so I as just as a, a fan of this team as a fan of football that's one thing that I cannot wait to see JT this Sunday is what does the offense look like what new wrinkles do we see uh, at Allegiant Stadium the next breaking news to come out of this building it could be today later today tomorrow is the quarterback who's going to be the starting quarterback will let Antonio P- Pierce obviously make that decision and tell the Raiders media about this. Well, let me tell you about the Giants. The Giants have won eight championships, four in the Super Bowl era and four in the NFL era pre-Super Bowl. They are a foundational organization in the history of this league. They have a lot of pride. They got a big fan base, and they've never been here before, and they're coming. And the same could be said about the Jets. The Raiders are going to have to play their best football to win this game. The Giants have recently played two of the worst games in the history of their organization. Their home opener to the Cowboys where they got shut out statistically was the worst Giant game ever played dating back to leather helmets. And then the Jet game that they just lost where they had the game iced. They missed a field goal late, game iced. The Jets went the length of the field, tied it up, went to overtime, and won it. Okay, so they are coming off a humiliating loss in the tri-state area against the Jets where everybody's divided with the Giants and the Jets. The focus on this team, and Daniel Jones is not a good, he's a very good above-average runner. He reportedly is coming back. He can make every throw. He beat Kirk Cousins and the Vikings in the playoffs in a very hostile environment. Their record's 2-6. and six. They're not passing the ball well, but keep an eye on the rushing yards because I, I talked to Eric Allen about it yesterday on Raiders Press Conference Live. He went up against Tiki Barber. Tiki Barber had one of the greatest games ever played at the Oakland Coliseum for a running back. And this Saquon Barkley is as good as Tiki Barber. So they're going to be able to run it. 
they are going to be able to run it hard, and they're going to lean on a great running back equal to Josh Jacobs. This giant team is coming in upset. They're desperate for a win, and the Raiders got to put them down quick. When you talk about seeing teams coming off of tough losses that know how to run the ball, JT, so we saw on Monday night, right? We saw the Lions coming in, able to come home, kind of assert their will on the ground uh, against the uh, against the Las Vegas Raiders. And so to me, I think that's where it begins all the time. We talked with Lincoln about the offensive line play. Uh, we talk about the line play in general, both sides of the football. The Raiders' defense is going to have to come to play. And give them credit. Give Patrick Graham and, and Max Crosby and all those guys credit. They have been playing a quality brand of football. They are going to have to stop the run. They are going to have to make the, excuse me, the Giants one-dimensional yeah. on offense. And I think a big one for me, can the Raiders win the turnover battle? Right. We have now seen it. that We talk about the, the turnovers come in bunches. We saw what Max Crosby did. We saw what Marcus Peters was able to do Monday night on primetime. Can they roll that momentum uh, you know, over into Sunday? And look, let's make no, no, uh, no mistake about it. This is going to be a motivated Raiders team Absolutely. ready to go. This is going to be all 53 guys in that locker room, the practice squad guys, they are going to be ready to rock for Antonio Pierce. Can they ride this wave of momentum? That's what I'm excited to see. Well, the offense is going to score. They're going to have to. Have I to. hope it just infuses the offense to get going here. For Eddie Pascal, I'm JD. We had a lot of guests today. We appreciate them coming on late notice. We greatly appreciate you. We wish the former GM, head coach, offensive coordinator well. This is a business. A big business decision was made by the owner, Mark Davis. And we will move on with all of our content on all of our platforms. Thanks for watching and listening to Raiders Roundtable.